Dr. Emily Seitz here in the implementation track. We're going to take all the information that you learn and put it into actual clinical practice. Eyes on 2022 is one of the largest virtual education events ever hosted in eye care industry, with other 9,500 registrants from optometrists, ophthalmologists, and technicians. At this three-day event, we'll be delivering 11 free hours of COPE-approved CE, seven hours of CME, and 36 hours of additional courses from over 70 world-class speakers. At this event, you'll learn how to grow your practice and expand your clinical skills with cutting-edge clinical and practice management education. Additionally, you can check out 22 custom design exhibitor booths and explore the latest technologies. Be sure to visit the Innovation Zone, an all new area where products, services, and ideas are highlighted as potentially changing the future of eye care. Not only great education is what you're gonna get from this, but you're also gonna get registration for wonderful prizes. We have over $8,000 worth of prizes that will be given out periodically through the show. And there's three different ways that you can end up winning prizes. The first is by checking out all the vendor booths. The second is by exploring the platform, clicking on different icons and getting surprise raffle tickets. I did that last year where I went to our virtual coffee bar and got, got a free raffle ticket. The third is by doing what you're doing right now, which is turn, tuning into the live programming and hearing from moderators who will give you raffle codes in return. A really, really important note, this happened last year and I wanted to make sure you guys all understand, if you are looking to get CE credit or CME credit, you have to do a pre-test form before you watch your first CE or CME session. We had a lot of questions on that last year, so hopefully that clarifies. Feel free to use the chat if you have any additional questions. You can head to the Continuing Education Hub to take the test. It's not graded, it's just to measure how you learn. Without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and start here with our implementation track, where we are gonna cover tapping into your largest untapped value in 2022, billy, billing, coding, and valuing your training with Dr. Chris Wolf. Thanks, Dr. Seitz, I appreciate it. Thanks everybody for joining us today. I think it's a lot of fun to do these types of talks. And my goal here is to give you some perspective about what's really important and what we see within the data of kind of aggregate data in terms of what optometry currently does in terms of billing. And then I'm going to kind of extrapolate that data to know where we're making mistakes in billing and coding and then also losing value. And then we'll kind of project forward what we would expect over the next few years and where those opportunities will, um, will present themselves. So this is my family. Um, we just had our ninth child uh, about five weeks ago. So they're a ton of fun. They're why I do what I do. And, um, and it's great. So depending on where I'm at the, in the country, people will either say you're either Catholic or Mormon. And I say, you're correct. I am one of those. And so uh, again, what we're going to talk about is the financial impact of incorrect coding. So what are we losing in our practices because we're not doing things well? Also, what's the financial impact of routine examinations and also stagnant um, reimbursements if we have inflation. We're going to talk about that. Uh, the financial impact of medical evaluations. I'm going to give you, we're not going to have a bunch of time, but you can actually see how you could model any management of a chronic or acute eye disease. You could actually model that out in terms of revenue uh, based on Medicare national averages. And, uh, and we'll give, go through a couple of examples there so you can kind of see what that financial impact would be. And then we're going to talk about, obviously, opportunities to tap into that value and, and what, what you really can do and kind of how most of us in a, in a primary care setting uh, can utilize all of our knowledge, education, and training in a way that really mainly helps our patients, but then can help the practice as well. So a little bit more on my background. Um, I spent uh, about seven years preparing doctors and students for their board examinations. And one of the things that we found was that um, that people were really well trained. Our schools are doing a great job training people to manage eye disease, but there's comes out this time where we leave where we leave school and we have to figure out how we're going to generate revenue in our practices. And unfortunately, if we're not uh, trained really well on how to generate that revenue and, and the value of each of the different services that we're providing, then we'll gravitate toward whatever the scenario, whoever the, owns the practice or the corporation that owns the practice, whatever they're used to doing. And we kind of fit that into our system and we learn how to do it that way. And so then we're going to naturally gravitate toward the way that we understand how to take care of patients and how to generate revenue for the practice, uh, as opposed to kind of thinking through it um, 
uh, in a mechanistic way so that we can understand what those value, that value is. And so we're going to talk about the financial impact of co coding incorrectly first. So we really make three errors, as optometry specifically makes three errors. We undercode, we undercharge, and we generally undermanage. And when I say we undermanage, we're going to talk about the data that supports this, but but it doesn't mean that you know we're missing disease. It doesn't mean that we're missing obvious disease and, and the big ones that, that are blinding, we're not missing, uh, but we're not managing them. We're either kind of detecting and referring, this is what the data tells us, or we're detecting and monitoring it, but we're monitoring it under an entity that isn't really built for us to get compensated for our value of monitoring it. And so in any case, let's look at some different examples. Uh, the first example would be uh, how we undercode. So if you look at a bell curve distribution, I love this data. So this is data that, um, that I worked with one state. There's an entity called an independent physician association. So you'll hear uh, from the AOA, and I'm a, I'm a big supporter of the AOA, um, but anytime you go to a, one of your state association meetings or an AOA meeting, we, we really get into this like antitrust. Like you cannot collectively negotiate um, together. So we can't get together in a room and say, hey, we're going to charge $25 for this service and $150 for that service. That's absolutely true. We can't do that. Except that there is a, uh, a provision that would allow us. There's a legal entity that is called an independent physician association. They're similar to it, um, hospital physician associations. And what they do is they basically say, look, all of the doctors underneath our umbrella are operating within our system. And so we're going to negotiate with an insurance payer for reimbursements for those doctors. That's legitimate. That's totally legitimate. Um, there's really two entities. I'm not going to get into the details of, of the nuances of each entity, but essentially um, this particular state was looking at how would we create that and how would we save an insurance um, payer money by bringing out of um, by bringing doctors who are overbilling and overcoding back in line so that they match a normal distribution. And so what you're seeing here in sort of the bluish green um, line is our normal distribution data. It is. It's not exactly right, um, but if you kind of aggregate all of our new 99 codes uh, and establish 99 codes into a bell curve, this is essentially what a payer would be expecting to see from our, our profession. And so they, they expect about 40% uh, percent to come from level threes, 40% to come from level fours. It, it tilts differently based on new and established patients. But then about 13% about of all of our 99 codes should be level twos and about five to 6% ought to be level fives. And so that's what they're expecting to see. And in most professions, if you think about this, I, I don't know, um, can you see, if you can give me a head nod, Doc, can you see where my cursor is right now on the screen? So most of the time, professions will have about 20% of their providers that would be skewed to the right. They'll have a blip over here where you'll, you'll get these doctors who are outliers here, and you can bring them back in line by, by good education and showing them where they're doing things in, incorrectly, and you can save, save the, the payer money, and then that money can be distributed among the whole independent physician association. That's, that's sort of the value proposition to both ends of the spectrum. But when we looked at this payer's data, and this was a lar the largest private payer in this one specific state, when you looked at this payer's data, we didn't have anybody over there. So we didn't have this large skewing to the right data that most professions have. We have this data that's skewed to the left, and meaning that we're undercoding um, based on the, the, um, the types of code that this payer expects us. We're undercoding, and we're, we have this really significant dearth of almost a fear of using level fours and level fives. In fact, in this whole distribution of about 350 doctors, uh, there was only about 20 doctors that fell right in line with this normal distribution curve. And there was one doctor who was out of bounds here, just one. So uh, the point is, is that no matter what state that we look at this data, no matter what insurance plan we look at this data, optometrists generally tend to undercode. And, and I think there's really a couple of reasons for that. One is because optometrists are really good people, right? Eye doctors are really good people. We're just trying, audits. Well, often we want to help people. We also are a little risk averse in this case. We're worried that if somebody comes and looks at our charts and asks us uh, and audits us, first of all, it's God forbid the audit. Audit. We don't want to be audited. So we, we're we're not even getting close to it. We say, well, what what am I going to do that's going to trigger an audit? So we get really worried about an audit. 
where we should be is, look, my, my documentation stands up to that ch patient's cheap complaint and what that specific patient needed for this specific situation. And all my documentation will support that. So I don't want an audit, but if you audit me, you're going to see that we did everything that we should have done. And worst case scenario, if you're not being fraudulent and you just didn't document something well, like you didn't order a test right, or you didn't interpret it, or you didn't sign your chart or something like that. Well, okay, then you're going to owe them a little bit of money. But, but the bottom line is that if you're doing things the right way, you really shouldn't have to fear an audit. And so in any case, that's what we see. So we're under coding uh, when we look at the data. The other thing that we're doing is we're undercharging. So when we look at insurance data, there's a, a couple of ways that we can look at this. The first way is if we actually take that same state and that same single payer, the largest private payer in that specific state, we can actually see three different bar, bar graphs here. Uh, the first one is if we assume that that uh, distribution curve was appropriately skewed to the left, as I'm showing you, and we actually used those codes that we, we build, and then we charged what we what those providers charge that insurance plan um that's what we that's what you see here in this first bar graph right there to the middle that would be the con the contracted rate based on those actual codes used so basically what i'm saying here is this insurance plan would have been willing to pay us that middle bar even if our our um, distribution was appropriately skewed to the left so what i to say that even one more way is to say Let's assume that the level of care that optometrists provided was actually, in fact, lower, and we weren't undercoding. We were just lower because we were seeing less complex patients and providing lower levels of exams. Even if that were true, this payer on this middle bar graph would have been happy to pay us more money than we actually charged them. And then this last bar graph that you're seeing is if we would normalize our distribution curve, if we would utilize 99 codes and 92 codes appropriately, then, um, then this payer would have been pay willing to pay us that much money. And the difference there was about $7 million. This is one year, one state, one, per, one payer. And so $7 million. So if you, if you extrapolate that on average over, the, over that course of the year, uh, over the 350 optometrists, that's about $23,000 per optometrist uh, in, that, in that specific state. And, and if you extrapolate that over the course of a 30 year practice lifetime, you're talking 600 grand and then you compound it with interest. You can do a lot of fun math that way. But the bottom line is that's number two, we're undercharging. The other way that we can see undercharging is super bill data. So I, um, one of the things I'll do is I'll help uh, both optometrists and ophthalmology practices with um, audits. And so, um, so we look at, okay, did you, did you, were you overcoded, undercoded? Did you code appropriately? And, and one of the things that they'll share with me is they'll share with me uh, fee schedules. And so, um, first of all, I never see ophthalmology do this. Ophthalmology does not under uh, undercharge. They basically know what every payer will pay them. Maybe it's because they're a practice administrator. Maybe they just have a better sense of their value than we have, than optometrists have. But, but the bottom line is that uh, I've never once seen an ophthalmologist that won't charge at the very least what their highest payer will pay them. And so you're seeing kind of averages. Um, uh, actually, you're seeing kind of lower ends on both spectrums for, the, for o ODs and OMDs. Uh, Medicare there is in blue for you. And then private payer, an example of a private payer in, the, in this scenario, when, when you look at a, one specific state of data, um, you, you can see where that private payer is. And, and if you look at the, the OD charges, um, the difference between that Medicare value and that private payer value means that every single time that that OD is charging that private payer, the Medicare rate, they're leaving dollars on the table. Um, and so we see this across the board for all for, for a significant number of optometrists and really all of their codes are, are lower. And so that obviously leads to that other um, kind of scenario that we talked about where we're leaving a lot of money on the table for uh, a payer who says, hey, we believe you're worth this amount for this specific code. And the other thing that's interesting is, is when doctors say, well, what, why, you know, um, I don't know if I can charge more. I always say, well, yeah, but this insurance company thinks that they're bringing you a bunch of patients that we're going to have access to your services and they're expecting a discount. So actually you, you are probably worth more than what that insurance company for those services, than what that insurance company is, is contracting with you. Uh, they actually think they're getting some sort of discount from it. So in any case, that's, that's, uh, that's the third error that we make 
in terms of undercharging. So uh, let me ask you, I want you to think about this. We were considering doing polls and I'm not sure if, if you all can chat in, but I will monitor the chat. Uh, and, and by the way, if, if there's any questions that you have, you can certainly chime in and, and, um, and I'll address them when we need to. But think about it this way. If we look at um, a specific MBA metrics, so there's a couple different ones um, and I'll show you some data here. What was the percentage of the average revenue generated by an independent optometrist on average for managing medical conditions. What would you think that number is? I love this data, um, by the way, but um, it's very helpful to see what people are doing. But just think about that, uh, what you think they're doing. And so what MBA metrics are, there's a 2019 version, um, but the 2019 version doesn't look at... Um, it doesn't look at this, this data. Uh, it looks at some additional data, but it didn't look at what I'm gonna reference here. But basically it's about 2000 uh, independent or private optometric practices across the country that participate in this survey. And they do it every few years. So they did 2018 version and 2019 version. They asked a few different things here. Um, I know Izon uh, does some of this as well. And so you can look to this data. And, um, and when we look at this, we'll see a couple things. So first, um, on average, a, a private practice will generate about 54% of their revenue from the sale of something, from the sale of glasses or the sale of contact lenses. And if you add in kind of routine exams, uh, it's going to be about 80, 82% of the revenue from a routine exam plus the sale of contact lenses plus the sale of glasses. So you can see that when you think about eye disease, it's that 7% portion. And the point I like to make on almost every single time that I talk about uh, billing and coding or even eye diseases in general is when, um, when states ask me to come talk across the country, they almost always choose one of my 11 to 12 hours of ocular disease management. Uh, and when you look at the listing of um, of offerings that you have at regional and large uh, and even state meetings, you'll see that the majority of the things that we are learning is related to medical eye care. But, but that's not really transitioning yet into what we're doing in practice. And I think that's because, again, we're not fully realizing the value of those services. And I think that's one of the things that we want to think about in 2022. Um, so we will talk about that. Uh, and, and, and again, I think the other thing that's important here is to know that I am not saying that we ought to be shrinking the amount of uh, widgets that we're selling, you know, in terms of prescription eyewear and contact lenses and even the, the primary care or routine eye exams that we're providing. I don't think that, that we need to be not doing that. I think that we can grow the entire pie by growing all the pieces, but specifically growing that medical piece. It's not an either or uh, situation in my, in my view. And we'll talk about how I, I believe we can do that. So Here's another way that we can look at unmanaging. So you're gonna see here, this is again, MBA metric data. So they asked, okay, if you have a thousand patients, uh, how many of those patients are you managing that have each one of these specific eye diseases? And what I want you to note here is that we don't even have diabetes. We don't have uh, glaucoma suspects. We don't have macular degeneration uh, listed within any of these things. But if you added that in, you're gonna have this huge growing pool. So we're going to look at this middle column first. That's the average reported based on MBA metrics. And what this is saying is that for every 1,000 patients that you're seeing on an annual basis, on average, 27 of them will be managed for dry eye, 17 for infection, 14 for allergy, 31 for glaucoma, et cetera. So if we look at prevalence data, so we look at studies and, and prevalence data, and we, and we lump dry eye and meibomian gland dysfunction in, and also when we're looking at this prevalence data, I've only included studies that apply to um, patients over the age of 40. Now, you certainly can use patients under the age of 40 as well, and, and you could throw in things like allergy, keratoconus, convergence insufficiency, um, strabismus, amblyopia. And if you assumed that every patient was only entitled to one disease, then you would get this almost the same number. It would be about 80% of patients would have an, uh, an ocular disease that ought to be managed. So the point here is that um, in a practice that has a thousand active patients doing a thousand comprehensive exams per year, uh, you would expect almost another thousand patients to have an eye disease, just one of those first four eye diseases that you ought to be managing. And, um, and so if that's not the case, uh, then, then you really gotta wonder if you're, if you're not looking at 
if you're not trying to capture patients earlier, or you're not communicating to your patients uh, as a, as as you ought to be, that you are um, offering certain services. Uh, so in any case, that should be your attitude. Your attitude almost should be when you walk into a, an exam room, understanding prevalence data. I'm gonna my my routine exam, my routine we'll call it a managed vision care exam. I am there to detect any potential eye disease, and I'm gonna prove to myself there's not an eye disease there. And I'm assuming there's going to be one until proven otherwise. That's that's a, the value that you should offer. Now, the disconnect is that people, and we're going to talk about this, is the disconnect often is that people will try to provide all that value underneath the routine eye exam or the, the managed vision care exam. That's not what it's built for. And so there are mechanisms that, that we can that we can use to, to change that. Now, we also undermanage, not just Chris Wolf saying this, but actually on my podcast, I talked to Dr. Edlow yesterday, um, great conversation, and we talked a lot about what we're talking about here today, but we really dive deep into his numbers. And so what I wanted to do is just share with you uh, the next two slides are, excuse me, the next slide, and then I have a, two more, a couple more later that are basically Dr. Edlow's numbers. So I want to give him credit here because I wanted to point out something that's just other people that aren't looking at it the exact same way I am. They're, they're coming to the same conclusions by looking at different data. So what Dr. Edlow did and actually does, and he has for 30 years done this, um, is he, he constantly looks at uh, the, the most recent Medicare billing data. Now that doesn't include um, me, you know, private payers or Medicare Advantage plans or uh, Medicaid plans, but he's basically looking at Medicare services. And one scenario that you could assume is that the Medicare services that he is looking at, you know, you could have a scenario of a patient that's a 65, let's say 67 year old male that comes in with blurry distance vision, best corrected to 2025, not quite ready for cataract surgery yet. He has an increase in his myopic um, prescription. He's got new, new prescription. The, the diagnosis code may, may be H25.13 uh, and that gets submitted. So he says that's not really enough to say that the doctor is managing medical eye care. It certainly is, but really managing disease. Um, he says you've got to probably be doing. I mean, there's you know he'll he'll argue with you to say that there's probably other ways to look at this, and we're going to look at a couple of those other ways also. But one way is that um, that you can look at what additional tests are they doing. So. Um, if you if you look at any procedure code build, that means a 99 office visit or a 92 office visit, uh, and then any of these things, basically in 2016, 61% of optometrists across the country build anything to Medicare in 2016. In 2019, 627 of the, of a uh, of us percent of us built build anything to Medicare. So that's an improvement, but but again, you would wonder why isn't the other 30 you know 38 percent or 37 percent of the of the optometrists billing anything to Medicare? And then if you look at okay, now in order to say that we're managing diseases, we're probably those those of us who are managing diseases are probably running fields. They're probably running some of sort of uh, OCT, or they're probably doing some photo. So at the very lowest threshold, if we said okay, in order to say we have optometry that's managing a disease, they have to be doing an office visit, a 99 code or a 92 code, and another um, another uh, test, right? And so if we look at uh, that plus a 92083, essentially in so a visual field, uh, in 2016, 27% of optometrists across the country uh, were doing were basically managing eye disease. In in 2019, if we look at that, it'd be about 29% of us, just about 30% of us. And so again, that challenge is well, well, we're growing. I mean, we're expanding this, but there's a significant. Um, uh, challenge with it. And so if you want to know why that might be happening, one of the reasons it might be happening is if we didn't build in systems in our practice to be able to say, okay, well, I know now I'm going to get outside of this, okay, exam refraction, next patient, exam refraction, next patient, exam refraction, next patient. And now we get into this exam refraction, identifying that this patient has a problem, bring them back, evaluation, uh, you know, testing, et cetera. So uh, I think that's really interesting numbers to look at. And, and basically, it shows us the same thing that we're seeing in other data. Please go ahead. There's a question. 
Yeah, Chris, I actually had a question because of course I'm a new provider and so billing and coding is one of my biggest, biggest obstacles that I'm trying to overcome. But I'm trying to think about this as a realistic situation or a realistic kind of example. Let's say a patient is, that they do have Medicare um, and they have vision insurance as well. Can I bill their comprehensive through their vision insurance? And then if they have systemic hypertension, can I bill photos to Medicare? You sure could. Yeah. On, on, if you're talking about your same visit, you sure could. Okay. One thing that I would, one thing that I would propose, and that's a, a common thought that a lot of optometrists go through. And um, there's really a few different scenarios in terms of how you might want to manage that. Uh, and I think it comes down to your philosophy, but oftentimes what will happen is that doctor will just do exactly what you said. Sometimes they're going to say, uh, well, and most, um, most contemporarily trained ODs aren't going to do this, but uh, they're just going to say, oh, you've got high blood pressure. I'm seeing something funny back there on the retina. You need to go see the retina specialist. And they'll just routine exam. I see something back there. I'm not going to watch it. Uh, let go see the retina specialist. Okay. So there's that group. And then the, the other group says, okay, well, this managed vision care uh, is not reimbursing me to actually manage that patient's high blood pressure, right? Like they're not, they're not there. They're not, that's not built there for me to uh, say, I'm going to take on the liability of managing this, having the conversation with the patient and communicating with the primary care doctor and all these other sorts of things, right? Now, I'm just saying the other third third uh, wheel. So what, what's bringing in that patient for their chief complaint? If their chief complaint is specifically related to their, uh, their refractive state only, and you identify in that exam that there is some other potential like hypertensive retinopathy, then you might say, look, we need to monitor this hypertensive retinopathy. And I would monitor it in any other way. Maybe I want to watch it to make sure it's not progressing in six months, or maybe it's a year. It doesn't matter. But at that point, now that it's going to trigger a, another follow-up visit for you to actually spend the time to monitor that thing. I see. And so you're so, saying essentially, yes, if it's warranted in the chief complaint at their comprehensive exam, bring them back for a second medical exam. If you're just using it just individually, like a fundus photo individually, you can still bill it to Medicare even with their comprehensive. If it's like yeah. no, you know, maybe mild crossing changes, but no active retinopathy. Right, okay. right. You can do that. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Great question. Okay. So, um, so if we look at, um, well, we'll talk about this next um, poll. So if I were to ask you, what do you think? In 2017, this is the most recent data I've got. Uh, what percentage of optometrists write less than five prescriptions for glaucoma medications in that year? So how many of us are writing less than five prescriptions for glaucoma per year? So this is data that um, is from a pharmaceutical company. So the pharmaceutical companies can have access to um, prescribing data. Um, and there's obviously databases that are for sale for people to purchase. Uh, so when we look at this, this data, uh, in terms of undermanaging. So another way that, that we can see that we're undermanaging, each one of these tiers that you're seeing on this, um, on this screen uh, are uh, essentially number of patients um, being managed by, by an optometrist. So what, what you have to assume within these numbers is that, and it's not a, an exact fair assumption, but it's pretty close, is to assume that every single individual prescription for a glaucoma medication means one patient. So it could be the case, obviously, that a patient is on uh, latanoprost and comigan. Um, uh, so there would be two prescriptions for that patient uh, over the course of the year. But, but it, let's assume that every single patient that is being treated for, for glaucoma is being treated with one medication. In order to get to the first third of prescriptions, meaning that this entire um, entire data set represents about a thousand prescriptions, or excuse me, about a million prescriptions for glaucoma medications per year. And so in order to get to that first 330,000 prescriptions, 333,000 prescriptions, it takes 100, excuse me, 2,500 and some odd optometrists. So they're managing about 155 uh, glaucoma patients per year, uh, the top third of ODs. That middle third of ODs is managing about 85, excuse me, about 65 patients per year. And that bottom third, which is about 27,000 optometrists, are managing about 10 patients with glaucoma per year. 
the bottom third. And so what that translates into is that about 2,000 optometrists never wrote a glaucoma prescription in 2017. Now, in 2017, we did have uh, a, a, about two or three states were practically speaking, they didn't have very broad uh, glaucoma, or if any, glaucoma authorities. But if you take those states out of the mix, we, I mean, uh, again, a, a significant number. Uh, if you look, about 6.7% of all optometrists, right, about 50% of glaucoma prescriptions across the country. And then if you look at that last number, about 40% or 37% of ODs, right, less than five glaucoma prescriptions per year. So, uh, again, I think it comes back to this whole idea of if we're, if only 20 or if only 30% of us are running fields and managing a patient with fields and OCTs uh, and photos, then uh, not all of those patients need prescriptions. So then you have this significantly less number of those patients that will need a prescription medication in order to actually treat their glaucoma. And so again, uh, a huge undervaluing of, of our knowledge, education, and training and of the services that we actually provide. So now let's look at what's the financial impact of doing everything underneath the managed vision care plan. So I, I'm a 2008 grad, so that number always sticks in my mind uh, as sort of like a, a starting point. But if I were making $65 per routine examination, what this means is exam plus refraction, of course, um, in 2008, what would I need to be making today to have counteracted the, the inflation that has occurred over the last 13 and a half years? And not even to mention the last six months, but but the last 13 and a half years. So if you look at that data, I think it's really interesting to actually um, look at that. And we can look at it in, in a couple different ways. So this first black line would assume that that you your fees, your uh, managed vision care reimbursements were matched with the average inflation year over year. And the reason the first from, from 2008 to 2021 uh, actually has different amounts of inflation per year is that we have that data, we know it. And so that's that's actual data. From there on out, you see how those um, those lines become just very straight. That's basically that every year would assume the average of these first 13 years, you'd have the average inflation per year as we had for the first 13 years per year. So that's how I extrapolated that data. But, but essentially, if you looked at that and was, this black line would be me in 2008 accepting a managed vision care plan that I was happy to accept $65 for uh, an exam and refraction. And if we assume that we haven't been able to negotiate effectively with this managed vision care plan to increase our reimbursement rates for our exam and refraction, that we're still making $65 in order to just overcome inflation that has occurred over the last 13 and a half years, I, I need to be making, uh, to, to have the same power um, about $81 to $82 per exam to have the same buying power, or even to say that again, practice running power as uh, I had in 2008 from that same $65 exam. So that means that if I'm still making $65 for those patients, then I'm either have to see more of those patients, or I have to do exactly what that plan is paying me to do and have that patient back for anything else that the plan is not paying me for to do and let another plan pay me to do those things. Now, if we at, we're asked the same exact question and said, okay, now maybe, I, maybe I'm coming out of school today or 2021, and I, um, oh, yeah, and if we project forward, okay, so if we look at that 2030 data, so we look in at to 20, um, the next basically uh, nine, eight years to, to 2030, that means that I'm gonna have to make, just to counteract the inflation that's occurring, I'm gonna have to make almost $95 per exam and refraction uh, from a managed vision care plan to just um, meet or just match what I was doing in 2008 from a business management standpoint. So I either need to sell more stuff, which, you know, if you're, you know, I, could, I think if patients need it, that's fine. Uh, I have to either um, see more patients or I have to make sure I'm just doing what that um, plan is, is reimbursing me to do and having that patient back for additional uh, visits when it's clinically appropriate and let somebody else pay for that, um, that knowledge, education, and training. So if, if we ignore that and say, we just came out of school today and we're happy with $65 and we know that we can run our business on $65 for exam, uh, what would that number have been in 2008? Well, it would mean that in 2008, you would have been probably happy with $52 per exam. And in 2030, you are going to probably need about 70 
um, five seventy six dollars per um, exam in order to continue to do business based on that um, that level of reimbursement just for your exam and refraction uh, for that period of time that you're spending, whatever that period of time is that you're spending with patients. So I think it's an interesting way to think about uh, the impact of a stagnant managed vision care reimbursement. Uh, you can try to negotiate it. And if you can, if you're in a, in a situation that you can negotiate and they'll negotiate with you, wonderful. Or you can use some of these alternative um, uh, ways to manage patients. I'll also show you that, um, you know, there, there's sort of this downward pressure as well, uh, where you have this idea of the public, you know, talking about getting your eyes checked for 2450. And if you've ever taken a visibly um, eye test, or what they call a vision test, um, you know, it's basically a, um, a, it's certified as a, I'll just say it's, it's, it's registered uh, as a vision, basically a vision test, basically a, um, the same thing as our uh, visual acuity charts. So what they're charging patients for what is registered as a visual acuity chart is with a 30% off, meaning that they think they value it at about $35. Uh, is your exam valued at $35? Is your refraction valued at $35? Is your visual acuity chart valued at $35 per patient. That's what I want you to think about when you're thinking about what does visibly actually value that service as. And so in any case, um, it again is gonna impact things in the future. What, however that may impact us, um, these aren't my words in terms of visibly, this is how they're registered with, uh, with the FDA. Um, so in any case, um, other things, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit so you can compare uh, apples to apples, but I really like the idea of looking at all of the services we can provide, whether it is specialty contact lenses, dry eye, myopia management, glaucoma, macular degeneration, selling glasses and contact lenses. You can look at all of the value of that and say, it doesn't matter what I'm doing as an optometrist, as long as I'm in clinic doing something for patients. Um, I can compare all those things to the revenue that those things are generating for the practice, for the amount of time I'm spending for that one thing. So whether it's routine exam or medical care, I can just make it all exactly the same. So what this dollar value means is the revenue that is collected for the amount of time that the doctor is spending in clinic. So this is MBA metrics and the median independent practice across the country is generating $402 per OD hour, meaning that for every hour that doctor is seeing patients, uh, that practice is generating $402. And that could be providing an exam uh, and refraction and selling glasses or contact lenses, or it could be one hour doing that, another hour managing dry eye, doesn't matter. Um, so the bottom line with understanding this is it allows us to measure what we're doing in our practices and measure any other additional new procedures that we might um, want to offer or new services that we might wanna offer for our patients bump it up against that number. So how would you calculate your number? Well, I didn't put this equation in there, but essentially what you'd do is you'd take the amount of revenue that you generated, just pick your last year. So what, what did you generate in the last 12 months? Um, and then that means collected dollars. So gross revenue um, or net revenue, you could say. Uh, when I say net revenue, that doesn't mean after your cost of goods and all that kind of stuff, just what did you put in the bank, okay? Um, and then you could divide it by the amount of, of weeks uh, over the course of the year that you saw patients, the amount of hour, amount of days per week that you saw patients, not an amount of hours per day you were actually actively seeing patients in clinic. Don't, don't, you know, if you have administrative time, don't include that. And you can get your number. And then you can measure anything new against that number. So, um, so we're going to talk about the medical management and, and the impact of that medical management. But I want you to remember the $402, just either your number or remember $402 in your mind, because we're going to show you that that management of those medical conditions is going to be easily worth that based on Medicare national averages. Um, so if you look at glaucoma, for example, now what I've done here is I have used Medicare national averages to come up with the orange dollar values you're seeing on your screen. And I'm also assuming, um, I'm assuming that there is a refraction that you're that you're getting paid for, and the nine two codes are Medicare national averages. And I'm also assuming that you're doing a screening, you know, a screening uh, photo. In this case, we've got Optos on the on the screen. But let's say that you have a patient that has. Uh, we'll look at 
just an ocular hypertension patient. And you're going to provide a comprehensive exam, refraction, optic nerve head OCT, opto, opto, and an optos screener. And you're going to have that patient back in six months, maybe check their pressure. Maybe it's a month and you recheck their pressure. And let's say that each one of those visits, you see that patient twice a year. So, um, and let's say you haven't decided, you, you can see here that I, I use a 99213. If you've decided that this patient doesn't need treatment, the likelihood is that you're going to be at a level three. Uh, and we, and this is beyond the scope of that, but that's one of the, I specifically work on uh, with, with offices. I've got lots of different resources to know which level codes that you code out at. But the bottom line is that, um, that an ocular hypertension patient, if that's the only thing you're managing, is likely going to code out a level three code. Uh, and then you have a, a, a photo gonioscopy and, um, and a, and a 24 dash two for your first visit. If you charge $39 for your optos and we'll just put a, I'm not, this is not a recommendation of what you should charge. It's a placeholder. Um, but if you were to charge $50 for your refraction, even you could bump this down, charge what visibly thinks it's worth uh, for their VA chart, then um, you can charge $35 uh, and you could see how this number would adjust. But the bottom line here is this entire calculation, these two visits are worth to Medicare um, and these patients might pay for these services out of pocket are worth $486.96 per hour. Essentially, if, and it's not even a per hour deal, but, but if you were seeing this patient for 30 minutes here, 30 minutes there. So if you spend an hour total time with this patient per year, you didn't sell them any glasses, you didn't sell them any contact lenses, they're worth $486.96. Now, if you sold them glasses and contact lenses, that's all a benefit. And we know that these patients, as they age, they're also going to have other eye diseases like dry eye and allergy and other things that you might need to tend to. And so those patients have other, uh, other things. Now, if we were going to look at, at a patient who has moderate glaucoma, uh, what you're seeing here, what I've done is basically taken our clinical practice guidelines and our preferred practice patterns from the AOA and the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And you look at what we are, what they're, when you scale a patient based on mild, moderate, and severe, what, uh, how often you may need to see them and how many times you need to, uh, you're, we're recommended to do different fields or different tests. Uh, you can see all of that stratified here. Again, Medicare national averages. I've assumed that we have, in these cases, you're likely going to be at a level uh, four, moderate, severe. We can get into the details of that. But one of those details is that you probably have a prescription medication, which is going to elevate your risk. Um, but uh, there's another component to that. It may sometimes be a level three. But the bottom line is that if you're spending two hours a year with a patient with severe glaucoma, that's going to generate a total of $911, and um, and your average revenue per OD hour is going to be $455. And so I think that's helpful to think through. Now, if that's not enough for you, like if, if you're saying, gosh, you know, I, I'm already doing what really well. Um, let, me, let me make this last point. If I'm already doing really well, then I need to maybe see these patients at a, at a more rapid clip, or maybe I do see patients at a more rapid clip. Maybe I have really, I have a lot of techs in my practice and I have other, um, other uh, people that are helping me out in my practice. And so I can see patients in 15 minutes. Well, if you look at the, the revenue and, and we kind of extrapolate that out in terms of the amount of time, then you're, you're close to $1,000 per OD hour, not selling a thing, only using your knowledge, education, and training. So I'll pause there. There's probably a question about that. Yes, uh, Dr. Ruff, one of our attendees wanted to know, E wanted to know, what is the best way to set your fees? Because you mentioned, you know, this little structure and extrapolated some data out. What would your advice be to them for setting fees? So at the very least, I mean, a very quickly, quick, easy place to look is your Medicare numbers. But remember that, that one of the things that I talked about was um, a lot of ODs, if you're just setting Medicare numbers, you're probably leaving up to 50% on the table for when you're billing other, other payers. So what I would do is I would ask every single payer that every single medical payer that I'm uh, on contract with, um, I want a fee schedule. What's your fee schedule? That's an easy way to do it. Now, they should share that with you. Sometimes they, they um, don't share it easily, but that's a question you should be able to ask. It's part of your contract. They don't always, um, like, like I said, put it in your contract. They'll make reference to something else, but ask for it. And if, that's, if, if it's hard to track that down, which I know some payers are, then you got to wonder, well, why am I contracting with a payer who doesn't want to give me the information that I'm asking for, right? So then you can just say, okay, if I'm getting paid 100% of what I'm billing, means I'm probably not billing enough. 
right? Now, the other key is that you can't change. I can't change my, my billing to any, it has to be the same to everybody. That is, that is true. But okay, if I, if I, let's say I submit for a 99212 and I submit $50 and, um, and I get $50 back from this payer and I get $49 back from this payer. Well, then I know, okay, well, $50 isn't enough. I'm going to increase my fee to $55. And then I see what happens. And if I'm still getting 100% back on some of those payers, then my fee is going to continue to increase until I get less than what I'm submitting. That's another way to do it. It's a more challenging way, uh, but it's, it's one way if you're having a hard time um, getting the information from the payer. But the easiest way, the shortest way, the simplest answer I probably could have given you would have been just ask, the, ask, ask who you're contracted with. Um, okay, so that's the impact of managing glaucoma. So where are these additional opportunities? And we're going to kind of wrap this up to where I see us being able to uh, take advantage of this in 2022. So this really comes down to um, moving past these common objections. So it is not worth my time. I hear these all over the country. It's not worth my time to manage eye disease because I know that the amount of time it's going to take me to see a patient with glaucoma I could have seen a comprehensive exam and sold a pair of glasses. And I saw your face there. That was good. Thank you for that. Um, and saw a patient with glaucoma. But I've heard this objection. So I think, one, I've proved already that, it's, that it is worth your time. Okay, today I've proved that um, because uh, for the reasons there. Uh, and then I don't want to be taken away from time I could spend. And, I, and then the other one, I don't see very much. Uh, eye disease in my patient population. Again, I think I've disproved that as well with looking at prevalence data. So um, coming into those clinical scenarios to think this patient has a problem, I'm going to prove to myself that they don't. I'm going to assume they do until otherwise, uh, until proven otherwise. So opportunity number one, the, me the need for medical eye care is growing. This is again from Dr. Edlow's numbers. These next two slides are Dr. Edlow's numbers. But if you look at 2020 versus 2030, uh, and you look at the amount of, of routine services that are estimated to be um, uh, required in 2030, we have about 111 million services in 2020, uh, routine services. Uh, we're going to need about 2 million more per year by 2030. So we're going to need about 113 million per year. But in 2020, we had about 60 million um, medical evaluations, both optometry and ophthalmology. We're going to need about 21% more per year by 2030. And I think that number is going to continue to grow beyond that. So um, we're going to have to offer about 16 million more medical services per year by 2030. If we look at the growth of different provider pools, ophthalmology is increasing by about 3% um, in that total duration. That's not 3% per year. That's 0.3% per year for an entire decade. So they're going to increase their numbers by about 3%. But optometry is going to increase their numbers by 13% total. Uh, still not really probably enough. So if you, if you think about that, just think about, um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but if we look at cataract surgery uh, and we say that I think the number of cataract surgeries are estimated to increase during this period by approximately 4 million per year something like that, or excuse me, 1.6 million per year. And there's going to be essentially uh, another 60 ophthalmologists per year to provide those. Um, so like another 600 ophthalmologists to provide another 4 million cataract surgeries. It's just completely untenable, which means that optometry has to um, definitely manage the everything that they can do in terms of an office-based setting. Uh, and that, I would challenge, also increases the scope of practice so that we are providing, continuing to provide minor procedures for patients that need them and that, that aren't, don't require uh, ambulatory surgical suites or, or hospital settings. And so in any case, uh, optometry is probably going to be the main driver of providing more of those services. And again, the, la the, the third opportunity is we can provide services that are covered by managed vision care plans and Medicare plans and patients. And so in that first um, kind of thought that I, that I, some people will look at it as a loss leader or a marketing expense, but basically you have this, the, the normal kind of center of a lot of optometry offices is that you have this routine exam and I'll sell them glasses and kind of lenses, but if there's anything abnormal, I'm going to send that patient to the ophthalmologist to get another opinion. And at best, that ophthalmologist sends them back for this routine exam. And then we have our profit center of glasses and contact lenses. At the very worst, that ophthalmologist keeps the patient, which turns a uh, basically a yellow kind of um, loss, but to a complete loss, because now that patient never comes back to, to the optometrist's office. And then, um, and so 
if we take that and say, well, we could do this differently, right? We have the annual exam that serves as this hub. This is my final point um, is if, we, if it serves as this hub, then all of these profit centers, right? And they're only profit centers when the patient has a reason for them to be seen, right? But if we have this, we've accepted a profit center of glasses and contact lenses. But if we also provide myopia management services and allergy services and AMD services, et cetera, now all of a sudden these are different um, things that patients need and secondarily they become profit centers. So this would be more of like a, a model where now that patient comes back in and we sort of have this flow in and out of a kind of a, a comprehensive exam, specialty care, so comprehensive exam, specialty care. And, uh, and that becomes the way that we have our entire value for the knowledge, education, and training that we have within our capabilities. So with that, I'll take any other additional questions. If you guys like podcasts, that's my podcast. You can use your QR code. Um, and uh, like and subscribe, five-star review. And thanks for your time today. I hope you guys have a great rest of your meeting. Thank you so much, Dr. Wolf. That was so helpful. I think like you're I on said, mute especially... still. Sorry. Yeah, I was just saying, especially as a new as a new OD, billing and coding is just one of the huge, huge obstacles that we have. So, I mean, I love practicing medically. So it's, it's nice to hear that, hey, there is a, also a financial benefit to just using the patients that you have, utilizing the training that you have um, and getting value out of the service that you already are really comfortable providing. Guys, I wanted to thank you for joining us on this track of our first day. So I'm gonna give you a raffle code. The raffle code is comfort. Comfort is our raffle code. So you can use that to enter to get one or many of our $8,000 worth of prizes while we have you here at Eyes on 2022. I did wanna say in this interim of time, please make sure that you are looking at our exhibit hall and visiting it. None of this would have been possible without our, our industry representatives supporting us through eye care and supporting this platform as well. You can live chat with team members from 22 different companies, just like you would do at an in-person event. You can talk to them, reach out and exchange information to just have a really unique kind of interaction. I also wanted to tell you that if you are gonna end up visiting, please check out the Double Platinum sponsor, which is Johnson & Johnson. They are actually toggling between both optometry and ophthalmology. So let them know which track you fall into, which profession you fall into, and they'll be able to um, have a really great discussion with you. We'll come back here in just a bit. And our next topic that we'll be diving into is the key to successful management and prescriptions for Acubu multifocal fit. We'll see you then.